Well, I thought I'd start the What The series. Now, first of all, I wanted to make it kind of clear that um, in no way do I, I, I intend to offend you, especially atheists. I don't want to come across as condescending or even as arrogant. However, I'm in a position where I've come to the conclusion of certain things because of the reasons that I'm about to give you. And having come to this conclusion, I've seen that there is a God that says, be bold about it, come forth and share these news, and do warn people of their errors. Well, so the big question, I, I thought this series would be a, a series on apologetics primarily for Christians. And one question that gets asked a lot, what's the difference between your God, Jesus, the Bible that you read, and all the other religious books, and all the other gods in the world? Why your God? That's a pretty good question. Um, Ice-T, how I love thee. And then atheists on YouTube primarily have been making a... a, a, a what I believe is a horrible mistake, it's a, it's a huge misconception, on coming up with the following quote, well, I worship the flying spaghetti monster, it's the same thing, so there. And then people are just inventing gods out of the blue, boom, boom, God here, God there, flying spaghetti monster. The tooth fairy, let's go worship Santa Claus. I'll just invent one myself here, the dingleberry monster. Why can't we just start a cult on the dingleberry monster and just say that he is God and he is true. Why is yours true and not mine true? Christians, when you're asked this, you'll say, well, that's an easy one. It's because of three very important factors that we worship God and we deem him to be the true God of the universe. But first of all, what is a God? Well, it's defined. If you look at a classical definition of God, it'll say the creator or creators and ruler or rulers of the universe. Is that fair? Man, I don't think I've ever used this phrase before, but to be a god, there are some um, very important job requirements. First of all, you have to be, you have to somehow have created a universe. The reason we can attest to the fact that the God of the Bible is the only one true God, number one, it is because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's a very important factor. Number two, it is because of prophecies in the Old Testament. And I, whoa, 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 whoa. I hear your objections already to each one of them. I'm going to address each objection. Number three, because of the person of Jesus of Nazareth. The resurrection of Jesus, the person of Jesus of Nazareth, and prophecies in the Old Testament. If you are going to produce a religion or a God, you better have something substantial to back it up. Let's begin with the first one. Now these three are kind of interlocked. They're, they're kind of, uh, they, they depend one on another. And the fascinating reason why these three elements do kind of depend on one another is what makes it so unique, what makes Christianity so unique and different from everything else, but, but ultimately points to um, the fundamental statements that Jesus made about himself and about what people were to believe. And so if you pay close attention, these three factors exist nowhere else in any other religion or belief system. Resurrections don't happen very often. We don't see them. Uh, we just don't see them every day. Is there proof of the resurrection? Yes, there is. The Bible, in the way that it flows, the Old Testament to the New Testament, there are prophecies, for example, in the book of Daniel, concerning kingdoms and powers that were to be, that came to be. There are prophecies about the birth, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, here's one common objection to prophecy. Well, it, they were written later by these Jewish men. Well. Here's where the Dead Sea Scrolls and the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls comes in. In the year of 2000, I went to a Dead Sea Scroll exhibition in Chicago, Illinois, in the Museum of Natural History. I took a King James and an NAS uh, Bible with me, and uh, I was mesmerized. I had read a lot about it before, but I was mesmerized to see on this exhibition pretty much every excerpts from pretty much every book in the Old Testament except Esther and, and a couple more. But what fascinated me is that they had up there the original carbon dated tested to 200 BC or so um, portions and pieces of, of those of those scrolls are written and right underneath literal translation of the text above. 
And I could see that this little translation, dated back to 200 B.C., before Christ, was accurate to the Bible that we have today. And what were these, or some of these, um, texts of? You guessed it. Some of them are of prophetic nature, of the coming of this Messiah. So this, this is not very touched, this is not very talked about in atheist circles, because... The Dead Sea Scrolls is a, is a pinpoint accurate statement that God, in a supernatural way, preserved the Old Testament to show us that there are prophecies about the coming of a Messiah. This is saying a lot because no other religious text, no other religious books in the world have prophecies the way that the Old Testament does. But what are these prophecies of? I mean, what if some religion had some prophecies that even might have come to pass? So I'll give you that. Well, the prophecies of the Old Testament testify of the coming of a Messiah who is going to show mankind who God is. I mean, if there is a book called the Old Testament that's talking about the coming of a man who's to be called the Messiah, Emmanuel, God with us, who's going to be testifying to mankind what God really is, if these prophecies are proven to be true, and I've just showed you that they are, and a man truly comes, the vast majority of historians testify that there was a Jesus Christ that lives in Nazareth, that lived in Nazareth, that came and lived and, and was crucified. Well, this catapults us to factor number two, the person of Jesus Christ. Well, this man who did have eyewitness accounts, and here, please, atheists, I'm going to try to be as nice as possible. Stop saying that there are no eyewitness accounts to the Gospels, because there is. John, for one, was a very close friend, disciple of Jesus Christ, lived with him, walked with him, ate with him, um, and wrote of him, and the things he said, and so forth. Whoa! And this is one of the reasons that we believe the God of the Bible is the only true God, because he prophesied through prophets of a coming of a Messiah. We later discovered this in 1947-48, the Dead Sea Scrolls, which were carbon dated to two, around 200 BC, we see some portions of prophecies and so forth in there. We're able to look today and see that they have not been changed, they have been preserved, and speak of a man who came and said, I am the way, the truth, the life. I am the narrow way. There is no other way except me. That makes you think. No other religion in the world has that. This is one or two of the main reasons why we Christians believe what we do. And this is why the flying spaghetti monster, the dingleberry monster, and everything else you can conjure up and create out there do not pass the test when it comes to what is real, quest veritas. The other reason, which is, in my opinion, the most fascinating one, is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Let's talk about that one for a minute. First of all, we have to understand that... The resurrection has to be proved historically. Now let's look at one of the objections here. When you say that the resurrection of Jesus cannot be proven historically because it, it leads to unreliable documents, well, I have a problem with that. The problem is that you're dismissing how the scientific method of proving something historically really works. Well, one of the major misconceptions of proving something historically, such as the resurrection, is the fact that it needs to be first eyewitness accounts. The thing is, as all real historians know, this is not how history works at all. Now, a real historian has to conclude that certain events took place to which we have no direct access, but which are the necessary postulates of that to which we do have access. And this is how scientific advances take place and happen. So concluding, if you say that uh, the resurrection did not happen because we do not have direct access to it today, you're not doing proper history at all. No other movement has come forth where a small group of Jewish men revolutionized the world so fast and so quickly because of a belief. Look at how Islam or Buddhism started. Totally different. So a, a mere crucifixion of a prophet cannot take the world by storm like the resurrection did. Another common objection that skeptics use about the resurrection is that to use the Bible to prove the resurrection sort of puts the cart before the horse. Due to the fact that a man named Paul became such an incredibly different human being and nowhere else can we see a transformation like this from night to day. Now this man, the Apostle Paul, becomes completely transformed. His world is turned inside out and that's what Jesus does to you when you give your life to him. He starts to 
inquire and research through the body of these believers who at first say, oh, look, it's a guy that beats us up. And he says, no, dudes, it's not anymore. It's me and Paul. I used to be Saul, but now I'm Paul. He starts to interview and talk to people. And then he writes that 500 people eyewitnessed the resurrected Jesus. It is true we do use the Bible to analyze and to look at the resurrection. But before you come to any conclusions, you have to understand back then what resurrection meant. So one just needs to dig in a little deeper in books to see that the re resurrection back then in the pagan world simply did not exist. Now you might come forward here and say, wait a minute, what about all those myths? I thought the resurrection was, was, was just a, uh, you know, the, the, the disciples just stole ideas from, from Egyptian myths and so forth. Wait a minute, let's get into that. This is another huge misconception. I watched that film when it came out, Religulous or Religulous, whatever you call it, with Bill Maher. But I was really disappointed at the lack of historical knowledge of the producers and of Bill Maher, unless they really just had an agenda to push. Ooh when they compared right on the screen right towards the end of the documentary they compared Jesus to the old pagan and uh, myths of, of, of the past and uh, it's wrong it's just not that at all look at Homer he wrote something similar to it but he rejected the idea of resurrection in the Iliads Patroclus becomes not a human anymore but just a like a witless phantom that's not resurrection the ancient myths denied the resurrection what these ancient myths described was a migration of souls completely different from uh, the resurrection of a bo uh, the, the, the bodily resurrection itself look at Apollo when he tries to bring a child back from the dead Zeus punishes both of them with a thunderbolt so before you come forth and say the resurrection was just a a stolen idea from all these ancient myths I challenge you to look at these myths um, deeper a bit more careful than you have before and not from secondhand accounts like Bill Maher, study and look for yourself and you will be surprised to see that the resurrection of Jesus was totally alien to the Jews of the time. The conclusion here is clear. Christianity was born into a world where its, its central claim was known to be false. Why do Christians believe that the God of the Bible, the Judeo-Christian God of the Bible, is the only true creator of heaven and earth? Let me sum it up for you. God makes himself known to man, chooses some prophets to start writing the Old Testament, which testify of who God is, his character. And then there, through these writings, we see that he is one God, not a whole bunch of gods creating the universe, one God. And then through these prophets, he makes prophecies concerning the fall of Jerusalem, the rise of four different empires, and the coming of the Messiah that was to save the world. Many years later, Jesus Christ is born, lives, and dies exactly as these prophecies talk about. He then later even resurrects from the dead and thus proves to everyone that what he was saying, that he was going to defeat death itself, was true. He said, I am that I am. Before Abraham was, I am. Now this man, way above the 300 million gods that have been created in India, way above Muhammad and Allah and everything else that man has conjured with his hands. This man, Jesus Nazareth, has proved beyond a shadow of a doubt that the things that he said are true. And that's why we can believe today. This is uh, the reason why Christianity stands alone and cannot be compared to anything else that man has created. And we will continue to create throughout the times because there's man is empty, is hungry for a higher purpose, is looking for God, and the desire to withdraw God from yourself is in itself a hunger, a seeking for, for, for a higher meaning, a higher purpose that only God can give. So Christian, next time a skeptic asks you, why do you believe in the God of the Bible? I mean, what about Hinduism? What about the 300 million gods? What about relativism? Well, it is because of the person of Jesus Christ, the prophecies concerning him in the Old Testament, and the resurrection of Jesus. How many have I offended out there? Hey, God bless you guys.